Hey there, I'm Stefan Kesting, and this is the Grapple Arts Radio Podcast. Hey everyone, today I've got Mordecai Finley with us, and we're going to start out, I think this conversation is going to go down some major digressions and rabbit holes, at least I hope it is. Uh, rabbit holes. Uh, rabbit holes. Yeah, yeah. We'll explain what that means in a minute. Yeah. Um, but first, uh, you started, you're in a black belt now, I'm so we've black got a black belt, belt in the house, mm-hmm. but you started rather late. I started at 45 years old. 45 years old. And uh, one impetus was um, my uh, third son was, uh, uh, second son, second child, second son, was uh, 18, went in the Marine Corps, and I looked at myself on the scale, and I had gone from a trim 170, 175 to 220 pounds, and I felt I was looking at death's door. Right. So I jogged, you know, watched my weight, nothing helped. So I said, I just got to get in shape. I also felt I had a couple of young kids, uh, one born in 94, one born in 97. So they're six and three. And I just felt I was becoming an old man. Right. So I saw a Gracie Jiu Jitsu uh, recording, a tape of uh, one of the uh, early UFCs. And I had been doing Shotokan karate when I was a younger guy. I would just practice my kicks and so forth and my katas. And I saw Gracie Jiu Jitsu and I thought, I could do that. I just felt it fit me. So I found a local studio. Had you ever wrestled before? Or you know, just in, in PE class in high school, and they wanted me to join the wrestling team. Okay. They thought I was, you know, I was, I had promise okay. took, and I, I didn't do it. But when I saw, you know, Hoist, and I think it was the karate champion of Japan, and I looked at what he was doing, I just had a, a some sense of inner recognition mm-hmm. that I would be good at it. So I joined the club, horribly out of shape. Um, we had what's called the Ralph's Club. So whenever you're in the studio and you want a Ralph, which means throw up. <laughs> so the Ralph's Club is out on the uh, – he just go out to the curb. Right. So I was regularly running out the studio, throwing up, cleaning up, coming back in. Hardcore. Excellent. Hardcore. And he said he said to me, um, you keep showing up, I'll do the rest. This was my, my first uh, club in uh, North Hollywood. So I said, okay, I'm putting myself in your hands. Mm-hmm. So uh, I began in October of 2000. And I had a lot of weight to lose and uh, went through a lot of pain. And I finally got my blue belt in uh, May of 2003. Okay. So three years for blue belt. Yeah. Three years for blue okay. belt. That's not a super long time, but that's a fairly long time. Yeah. Was this back before they gave out stripes? Uh, no, I, I went one stripe at a time okay. through my white belt. Um, but, you know, I was 220 pounds and I, I could barely breathe. Right. So first of all, I just had to, I had to cut weight. I was I was a weightlifter, so I could bench almost 300. I had to get rid of all that extra heaviness. And, uh, you know, he was serious about his blue belts. Our blue belt test was you had to fight everybody in the studio for 30 seconds. Okay. Um, and the top belt, I think, in the studio, that, that was a purple belt, all the way down to the last guy. And uh, when you finish, they, they would do a takedown. So I got slammed to the wall a bunch of times. Right. And then at the end, uh, we had to uh, alligator crawl across the mat, you know, toes and fingers, do 20 push-ups, and then pick up the blue belt with our teeth. <laughs> so was, was there the whipping that seems to be popular at some schools? No, no, we didn't do any, we didn't do any whipping. But it was, it was blue belt, you know, I th- like today. I mean, all the blue belts in my club are very good. So yeah. it, was a, it, was, it was a big thing. Well, and, the blue belt in jiu-jitsu is, I mean, you can get your black belt in taekwondo, there are lots of kids getting their black belts in Taekwondo in two, two and a half years. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Our blue belts, belts are good, and I was, I was a good blue belt. And then uh, what happened with me was uh, when I was a four striper blue belt, this would have been in uh, 06, uh, I had a heart attack, which completely changed my game. So, I did not expect this, but after a heart attack, I had a dimmer switch. So, when I would begin to feel fatigue, my body would just shut down. So, I had to really learn how to do cardio all over again. And then I was coming back up, and then I had a herniated disc, which is pain off the charts. Lower back, upper back, uh, neck. L4-5. Okay. So um, sciatica down yeah, the leg. exactly. Yeah. I, so my leg was numb, and my foot was asleep, and, and I ended up on crutches for a while. I started doing yoga. I was a four-striper, and then I had to leave that first club because it was some miles away. It was very hard to drive. I joined a club near my home, which was very serendipitous because the club really just fit me. It's, you know, it's a... Beautiful coach and a beautiful system, wonderful guys. Um, you know, I would say ambitious, but not terribly competitive. No one wants to beat each other. So it was a really, it's an ideal club for me. And it was okay, around, what club was that? 
the club that I'm in now yeah. uh, is called Chris Lisciandro, a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu club in Sherman Oaks, and is part of Hinato Magno's system of street sports Jiu-Jitsu. Okay. So it's wonderful. Very happy they've been there since, uh, I guess, January of 09. So it was a good fit. How but, soon after walking through the door did you know it was a good fit? You know, I knew Chris because Chris uh, Lisciandro was a blue belt at my old club. Okay. And he and I got along well together. And when I called him up and I said, hey, Chris, it's Mordecai. He said, the rabbi? I said, yeah, the rabbi. <laughs> so he said, come on in. I told my concerns. I said, look, I'm, I, I'm a heart attack survivor. I have a herniated disc. I love the sport. I said, I just can't get injured. And he said, you're in the right place. So he and I had a talk. I came to the club. I would sometimes come on crutches, put the crutches down because there's no sciatica when you wrestle because you're not on, you're not on your feet. Okay. So it was great. So um, I got there in 09. I received my purple belt in December of, of uh, 2010 from Chris and Hanato. Hanato was, uh, All right. And then uh, brown belt in December of 12. And then black belt in December of 19, in 2016. So having started that whole jiu-jitsu journey at a relatively older age, I mean, you weren't 18 years old. You haven't been doing it since you were 12. What advice would you give to people who are 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, thinking about starting jiu-jitsu? Yeah, it's almost like the advice in an AA program. Just keep coming back. It works. So you got to find someone who understands a, a, an older guy's body. Because sometimes they look at you, you look big and strong, but it feels different. For exa example, the difference between 45 and 62 is, is huge. I mean, I was actually a pretty good athlete at 45. At 62, it's, still, it's a struggle. So you have to have someone who's not going to push you beyond your envelope. Uh, you got to be with guys that, um, you know, not after glory of tapping out a blue belt or whatever the next belt is. And just go slow. Very important to stretch, I would say. I did not know the importance of taking yoga. So, for example, I got into yoga, my game picked up, um, and leave ego at the door. So my only goal when I come in is to come back the next time. I do not want to win. I don't want to outperform anybody. I just want to be better than the guy I was the day before and come back the next day. I've never actually heard that as an expression, that your goal is to come back the next day. That's I really, it. I really like that. That's yes, a... That it really is. Because sometimes, look, I'll get on the mat, I'm a black belt, and some blue belt will just work me and I'll start to feel bad a little bit. Coach reminds me, look, you're 62, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, so I went with a 24 year old blue belt recently and, uh, it was difficult. It's hard, good, strong kid. And so I thought to myself, well, I'm two and a half times as old as he is. Mm -hmm. So when I go with a guy who's 150, which is two and a half times as old as I am, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what it'll be like, yeah. right? So I just had Jiu-Jitsu math. Exactly. Yeah, Jiu-Jitsu Jiu math. math. I yeah. like it. Yeah. So uh, I thought my only goal is to come back. Right. So Tap early, tap often. Tap early and often, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. So that's my attitude. And what I usually tell people is that uh, Dan Inosanto, who's here in the greater Los Angeles area, started Jiu-Jitsu at age 65. Mm -hmm. Now, true, he had a lifetime of training right. before that, but also a lifetime of injuries mm -hmm. from all that training. I mean, you can't train for... 55 years and not have injuries and physical condition. Yeah. I mean, if you were playing tennis for 50 years, you'd yeah. be crippled with tennis style injuries. Mm -hmm. And he did it and he got his black belt, I believe at age 75. So wow. if he can start at age 65 and get his black belt at 75, yeah. then I mean, he was probably starting in pretty good physical condition, but still starting at age 65, that's pretty impressive. It is. And I don't, see any reason why I would ever have to stop. I mean, I, uh, I don't mountain bike. I don't ski. Mm -hmm. I, I just do jujitsu. That's, that's my main fun. How many times a week are you training? Uh, two to three times a week. Right. Sometimes a bit more, but usually two to three times a week. Okay. And is it all in the context of group classes or do you now find yourself going more towards calling up a buddy and saying, Hey, you want to roll? I've, I don't, um, you know, I have done that, but when I've done privates, it's been with Coach Chris. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only reason I don't now is because of time. Just my job is so demanding that that you know hour going down there is a half an hour there, half an hour back, half to get ready, and I just don't have the time. Mm -hmm. But I, I find that if I go to class, pay careful attention, take notes, memor you know, not memorize as in re rehearse in my mind and lock the moves in. And uh, also, whenever I learn something in class, I try to look it up on YouTube. 
And then uh, so you get that second hit. Get a second hit of how somebody else might teach it. And then I look. uh, I have a a library of uh, DVDs. um, With it, I have an excellent private tutor in my home, which is you. Okay, that's how I got to know (laughs) Stephen Kesney. Was uh, I have a large number of your DVDs, and they've been. You know, I just got to say, you are an excellent, excellent teacher. I really, really enjoy watching you. Well, thank you. I mean, fundamentally, it just comes from. Well, part of it is trying to learn it in a systematic way because I'm also pretty stressed for time. So trying to boil it down to its essentials because I don't have time to practice everything. And part of it is when I've learned something, it's how would I have liked to have learned this? I mean, when I started learning the butterfly guard, for example, I was literally looking at VHS tapes, mm-hmm. splicing them together and made my like greatest hits uh-huh. butterfly guard yeah. tape. This is back in God, early 2000s. Mm-hmm. And just watching that over and over again. I knew it was an important position, but there was nothing really good on it. And just trying to assemble that for myself. Now, there was probably value in that struggle, but I don't think it was the most efficient way. I, I don't regret you know, digging through all that uh, mm-hmm. dirt to find those little diamonds. Mm-hmm. But what if you just went straight to the diamond mine and had somebody show it to you in a way that yeah. makes sense? For I'd you? probably watch your Butterfly Half Guard uh, DVD mm-hmm. probably 50 to 100 times. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, before I leave here today, I'll give you the, uh, the. do you see Brandon Mullen's take on uh, the butterfly guard? I think you've mentioned it, but okay. I... All right. Well, I've got it here. Okay. I've got it here for yeah. you. So you're, you you have a yeah. a more systematic... Uh... When I get on my elliptical machine, I throw in... Oh, that's I, smart. Yeah. yeah. So I watch it on my, while I'm on my elliptical. Yeah. I'm just in the process of building a, a home gym as well. Oh. But the reason I asked about whether you do a lot of one-on-one training is ever since I built my home dojo a few years ago, it was something I'd wanted for ever since I started martial arts when I was 12 years old. So after 30 years of, of working towards it, I finally built the, the dojo, <clears throat> you know, a double, took a double garage, wow. matted it out, put mats on the wall, uh, insulation well, well, in there. Well, I, I do have mats, but I would mostly use them to uh, uh, when guests would come over. Okay. So guests would come over. Like, I was a sick blue belt. Right, right. I was sick for jujitsu. By the way, that's the reason my cardio guy says I survived my heart attack. Okay was because the uh, all three arteries were clogged <clears throat> and uh, the jujitsu forced my body to create a capillary bypass. Okay. He said, had I not been do- doing jujitsu, I probably would not have survived a heart attack. So your heart was working so hard doing jujitsu, it took a little capillary and enlarged it into some sort of vein it or artery. It just went right around the blockages. Okay. Because nothing, blood, not blood was getting through. Okay. So when they finally all clogged up, my blood just went through the capillaries and kept me alive until I got to the hospital. Okay. So I was... So friends would come over on a, like a Sabbath Eve to come to a, the rabbi's house for Friday night dinner. Uh-huh. I would say, anybody want to wrestle? <laughs> and, uh, and then when my daughter's got there's, old, there's a biblical uh, precedent for, uh, for wrestling. And we, and we always bring up the Jacob and Esau thing. You know, uh, Jacob's uh, wrestling with the bean. We, we don't know exactly what, who that was. And then uh, when my daughters got older with their boyfriends. Oh. Right? <laughs> Welcome over. Let me show you my gun collection yeah. or just choke you unconscious. Uh, both. Yeah. Uh, but I would uh, challenge them. They remember very well. Um, they'd come over for to hang out with my daughters. I said, let's go wrestle. <laughs> I got them young, <laughs> so they have muscle memory of my daughter's father putting hurt on them. Right, right, right. Yeah, and then they got older and they... That is a brilliant idea. Yeah, I wrestled with... I've got a 10-year-old daughter, so I think I'm going to incorporate when, that while I'm still she's young. she's about 14 and her friends come over, they yeah. spot in the backyard for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. kind of... Well, yeah, we're in the dojo cool. that's in just, fact, just down the fact, path. I wrote you an email. Because I found that this is called Catch as Catch Can, you know, back at backyard mm-hmm. wrestling. Yeah, yeah. And I wrote you an email and I said, you know, it's not really no gi wrestling, it's something else. And you told me it's called Catch as Catch Can. Here's what you want to look at. And you wrote me right back. And okay. so I, I looked up Catch as Catch Can. I looked up uh, Gene LaBelle. Yes. I got Gene LaBelle's book. <laughs> yeah. Here's 1,000 submission holes. Yeah, exactly. 900 of which you really need a lot of. Great, a great skill. To, I'm trying to find a politically correct way to say it. a great, a very great skill differential, yeah, or size differential to pull yeah. off. Yeah. So I had the skill. These guys, uh, you know, they were football, water polo, whatever, but none of them had uh, maybe even wrestling. Mm-hmm. None of them knew jujitsu, and boy, that was the proof of jujitsu. I could get on the <laughs> mat with a 16 year old football player, and I could just work him, choke him so, unconscious, or choke him silly. Yeah, exactly, choke him silly. Well, they were already silly. So yeah, I choked, right. I choked yeah. them more silly. But anyway, Teenage I taught boy. my daughters, by the way. Right. They both came out good. And my uh, 
taught him how to wrestle, uh, box, and shoot. Okay. So uh, uh, my youngest daughter actually joined the club, and she left for Israel with a blue belt. Okay. I'm very, very proud of her. Huh. And she's just about to go in the Army. She's on a kibbutz um, studying Hebrew. Okay. And when she's done with the language school, um, she'll... They call it drafted, but you're, you, when you go, you go voluntarily to be drafted. Right. So sometime, summer or soon after. Yeah. Okay. Well, sounds like she had a good, uh, a good grounding in uh, things martial. Absolutely. And, uh, and the mental toughness. Yeah, that's for sure. But, uh, excellent. Well, I guess, so for the sake of our listeners, this is the first ever grapple arts podcast in a synagogue. Right. And you're a rabbi. Hence, yes, I'm a and, rabbi. So you, are you the first? Black belt rabbi that well, you know of? And that I know and that, of. That's and one of the conversations we had. Exactly. I, I don't know of any others. but Because my coach says, he said, hey, the, are, are you the first black belt rabbi? So right. let me write a few people who are kind of a mm-hmm. national reputation. And uh, nobody knows if there's... I currently of, live in Vancouver, so there's almost a zero Jewish community. Yeah, there, but you, so. might, you might hear through yeah. grapevines. Yeah, so yeah. Someone might tell you. Uh, so I wrote my rabbinical association. Someone said... Uh, there was a Chinese man back in the 40s who had a black belt in Judo who converted to Judaism and became a rabbi. Okay. And there's a lot of rabbis who have black belts in karate. Sure. You know, probably in the couple dozen. But I don't know of anybody who has a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So I might be the first guy. Okay. Well, now that the podcast is out, mm-hmm. is there anybody else? We're, we're, we're crowdsourcing this. Yeah. Please tell me because I do not want to say that if there is indeed a... Uh, ordained rabbi who had a black belt before December 2016. Please <laughs> tell me. Do you ever work the jiu-jitsu into your, uh, uh, sorry, sermons? Uh, sir, oftentimes. Really? I work it into my counseling. Really? I work it into my sermons constantly. So you're that guy. I'm that guy who um, someone will say, uh, you know, my husband, my wife, they criticized me, and I had to say something back. I said, we don't let them get grips. <laughs> you know, a criticism is like a grip on your yi. You just sure. take the hand off. You say, I'm actually not fighting with you today. So you have you put your hand on my gi. I just rip your hand off. Right. I'm not fighting today. So I saw it's just called, you know, or just like removing grips. Or uh, I use jujitsu metaphors constantly when I counsel and, uh, and when I teach. Okay. Yeah, that's one example. And it's often, I mean, it must be a bit of a... a not paradigm shift, that's the wrong word, but a pattern interrupt for people who are, you know, thinking they're coming to a rabbi to, you know, just hear yeah. about all well, things my, biblical. My congregants well, know. they're used to it by now. Because what, what happened when I was a sick blue belt and probably up until my... Uh, you are already a rabbi then? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was ordained in 1990. Okay. So between my starting jujitsu in 2000 and my uh, back injury in 08, I would wrestle everywhere. So... We'd have a fundraising event at the synagogue, uh, and I'd go out in the, someone's backyard and wrestle all takers. <laughs> uh, I, I would be at bar mitzvahs. I'd be at a bar mitzvah reception. Like, like a carnival uh, carnival wrestler pretty, from the turn of the century, turn much. of the last century. Yeah, so exactly, pretty much. I'm, I'm at a bar mitzvah reception once, and uh, my wife comes up to some particularly fit young guy. She says, go jump the rabbi. He'd really, he'd really like it. <laughs> so the guy jumps me on the dance floor, and we wrestle, wrestle, wrestle. Of course, so I, I tap him out because I have you know, a couple of years of BJJ. So I'm walking back to my seat and some uh, older Jewish woman, you know, sniffed and said, I've never seen a rabbi wrestle at a bar mitzvah. I said, where are you from? She says, New Jersey. I said, this is California. We just all, it's like, yeah. you know. Every rabbi does every it. Every rabbi in California wrestles at reception. So. <laughs> so you have received a little bit of, of sniffy pushback. Uh, only from foreigners. Really? Okay. New, like my congregation. In does, California, it's watered up. Well, well my congregation, back. because okay. they all know about it. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, it, and the illustrious member of my congregation is uh, Dave Mamet, the famous uh, playwright. And uh, when he moved out to California, he met me, and he went to study with Hanato. And David and I more or less stayed uh, stayed parallel uh, with each other. He he's uh, sixty seven now, so I he's more he's or less. A guy? Oh yeah, he's a brown belt. Okay. Dave could have got his black belt if he just would have. I mean, Hanato kept saying, "Dave, come in and just get your black belt." Yeah. And so Dave's doing other stuff, but uh, yeah. So Dave and I would, uh, you know, we have a carnival-like holiday called Purim, which is actually this coming Saturday night. And at Purim, you know, I wrestle all, all takers. I have mats here in the synagogue in the, in the storage. <laughs> and I, of course, had mats at my house. So, yeah, they all knew the rabbi is, okay. is sick for jujitsu. Now, in my opinion, anyway, your most famous congregant that you had 
unfortunately, that I know of was Leonard Cohen. Right. Yeah. And, you know, as a Canadian uh, icon, yeah. I mean, you guys stole him from us, but uh, <laughs> uh, you never got him wrestling. No. Uh, no, Leonard, uh, when I met Leonard, he was, well, he was born in uh, 30. So he was, he came to Orha Torah in 2006. Okay. So that was so that's be, the synagogue here. Yeah, that's the name yeah. of our synagogue. Uh, we came into this building in 08. So when I met Leonard, we were uh, at our previous facility. We, we were renting a church. Okay. So uh, you like to hear how I met Leonard? Is that uh, interesting? Sure. Okay. So I officiated at the wedding of a record producer named uh, Larry Klein, okay. a very well-known producer, a fantastic producer. He produced Leonard's uh, wife, mate, spouse at the time, Anjani uh, Thomas. Yeah. Um, and uh, called Blue Alert. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Got on my uh, iPod. Yeah. Amazing CD. So I officiated the wedding of Larry uh, Klein and Luciana Souza, by the way, brilliant um, vocalist. And uh, I had said to Larry and Luciana, they said to me, can we do something different for our reception? I said, well, maybe have a few people, you know, give some witty advice regarding marriage. They said, came back weekly, said, okay, you. And so after the uh, wedding, I was seated next to Leonard and Anjani. And they were very intrigued, asking me a lot of questions. And then I went and did my shtick and came back to the seat. And it, it went over very well. Mm -hmm. And they really thought it was cool because I was self-deprecating and funny and wise and insightful. So we had a great conversation, but I did not know who Leonard Cohen was. That's the problem. Okay. Because I remember back in the 70s, I think my sister had a record of a guy named Leonard Cohen. I did not put it together. So I call my wife who's in Israel. I said, have you heard of Leonard Cohen? And she loses her mind. She loses her mind. She said, I used to cry myself to sleep writing poetry, <laughs> listening to Leonard Cohen. She says, are you kidding? You met him? What? I said, oh, no. So I went online and I downloaded some stuff. And the next week, Leonard and Anjani come walking into the synagogue. Okay. And I said, what's up? And, and she said, well, I loved your stuff on marriage and I thought Leonard would like you. So I brought him along and... They came weekly for a couple of years, and okay. Leonard began coming to my evening classes, and we became personal friends. He was at our home. Anjani and my wife became very close friends, and uh, he and I were never chummy. Um, we, we were philosophically very connected, but if we weren't doing philosophy, we were a little bit awkward around each other. Mm -hmm. But I, I really loved him, and I think he loved me. Now, of course, he's famous as a Zen Buddhist. Mm -hmm. So how does that... The, uh, and now we're totally getting off topic. This is the That's first of the rabbi holes, but I'm okay. This is my okay. podcast. I can okay. go wherever I want. Yeah. So how did he and you, I suppose separately, square the Zen Buddhism yeah. with the Judaism? Right. So he, he shared with me that Buddhism is not a religion. One time he said to me, it's a way of managing consciousness. And when he was up at the uh, monastery, he was a, uh, a monk, not a priest, I think is the way they put it. Maybe the other way around. Anyway, he said, uh, Roshi his very beloved teacher, he said it was a tuning port for consciousness. And the koans were just ways to transcend the ego mind. So he tells a story that uh, when he was up at Mount Baldy, some guys from uh, Chabad, which is an ultra-Orthodox Jewish uh, outreach organization, they went up there to save the, the Yid, the Jewish guy. So they, they went as an intervention. Yeah, they went as an intervention. They climbed up Mount Baldy, and they found him. And uh, they start talking, and it's quiet up there. So these guys are big talk. He says, shh, come in. So he takes them over to his, uh, to his uh, room, and he has his Hanukkah candles lit. And uh, so they're curious about it, and they start asking about meditation. So he, Leonard, is a, was a very educated Jew, and he, he knows. So he basically schooled them about Judaism and meditation, and he said he had some, uh, uh, some whiskey, and they, they got... <laughs> drunk and they they uh, trundle off down the mountain and so leonard he told me the story he said there's no contradiction he says judaism is my religion and zen buddhism is my mindfulness practice okay are there sort of antecedents or not antecedents but similar practices within judaism absolutely so, yeah there's a very strong now i'm totally out of my depth but that's that, why i'm that's, here chatting that's with fine. you yeah, there's a there's a clearly a mystical dimension that goes all the way back to the to the bible you can see it in Isaiah, ezekiel and other places the rabbis of the Talmud talk about mindfulness practices, definitely Jewish mysticism, the Kabbalah. There's a vast array of meditative, mindfulness, mystical practices. So I would say it's mysticism and meditative practices are coterminous with the Jewish religion, especially since the Kabbalah and Hasidism, which is a neo-Kabbalistic revival that began in the 1700s. So 
Absolutely. There's a strong mystical, contemplative, meditative side to the Jewish tradition. It's not typically been taught. That's the main problem. So when I was a uh, young man, I actually found my way to a Hasidic teacher, and he introduced me to this world. And that's probably something that has stamped my rabbinate, is I'm well known as a teacher of uh, spirituality, consciousness, mindfulness, etc. That's probably my the thing that I'm known for, for people that who know of my work. Well, why don't we take this opportunity to, to go further down the rabbit hole and to disambiguate me about that? Because I would have called it Kabbalah, mm -hmm. so that's already the incorrect pronunciation. Well, Kabbalah and Kabbalah are both correct. Okay. Uh, uh, there's a, a, How would you say it in Yiddish? Okay, Yiddish is a uh, Yiddish is a dialect of German. Um, that was the language of Jews in the Rhineland in the 1400s, oh. and they more or less kept their dialect. So if you understand German, you can understand. They're mutually yeah. intelligible. Yeah, I, I speak some German. And ah, okay. The, the, a lot of the Yiddish terms. Sure. And then they add in Polish words, Ukrainian words, Russian words, Romanian words. Okay. So it's basically a Germanic language. Uh, um, populated with lots of Eastern European and Hebrew words. Now, the difference in pronunciation is um, Hebrew is what has stress on what's called the ultimate syllable. So we say Kabbalah. Oh, okay. And Yiddish is penultimate, Kabbalah. Oh, okay. So therefore, there are completely valid two oh, different ways okay. of saying most words, Yiddish accented or Hebrew accented. Okay. So now, Kabbalah, then, mm -hmm. I mean, most people have heard about this in the context of Madonna mm -hmm. saying, oh, she studies the Kabbalah. Right. I think of pretty paintings that are sort of vaguely geometric. Mm -hmm. That's the extent of my knowledge. Hmm. So tell me what I well, <laughs> tell me well, what I don't know in the space of you know two fifteen minutes. minutes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so Madonna was uh, um, she became involved with what's called the Kabbalah Center. The uh, Kabbalah Center was founded, as far as I recall, by a uh, man named uh, Philip Berg back in the seventies, who had actually studied with an illustrious Kabbalist either the, the um, uh, Rabbi Yehuda Ashlag or one of his disciples. And the question is whether the Kabbalah should be taken out and taught to the unlettered Jewish and non-Jewish. It's a very big controversy. So almost like a Reformation-style argument, should the Bible be, the Christian Bible, be read by people not trained? And should we translate this into German as opposed to just keeping it's it in It's an ex excellent analogy. That if it really is, and the, the, the Kabbalah claims to be a map of the mind of God and a map of human consciousness. Um, so in a philosophic tradition, you want to map up, you want to connect your consciousness with divine consciousness. So Kabbalah claims to do this. It claims to be the, uh, the religion of Adam, for example, uh, Adam and Eve. So there's a controversy. Could it be somehow distilled and taught to the uninitiated, and also the Jewish uninitiated. And they decided yes. So they figured out a way that, for me, it oftentimes looks like a version of New Age thought. Now, I am uh, I'm a professor of mysticism and Kabbalah, so I'm sure I come at it with a critical and, and probably a little bit too much scrutiny. I know folks who have studied Kabbalah at the Kabbalah Center, and they love it. Other people feel that they were exploited, but that's everywhere. So my message there is, don't take anything completely literally. Uh, don't give anybody too much power over your life. And if it benefits you, great. And if it doesn't, you know, go to the next place. So what does the practice of it then look like? Okay. So the part of the practice, the teaching side, remember, part of what they're teaching is a way to manage consciousness. So I'll give you one example. When you study any spiritual system, one thing that you're taught is life is not about you. Now, all human beings have a natural default toward narcissism. Sure. To personalize everything. And when you say to yourself, I'm part of a larger system. Who knows if my point of view is the most significant? Who knows whether what I think actually has to win here? So it teaches you to stand back and see, see things in part of a larger, larger systematic perspective. Now, that's in any good spiritual system. Is so certain, everything from Stoicism exactly. to Buddhism to whatever. Precisely. So part of what the what I'll call Kabbalah Center Kabbalah is, is just as you're saying, I would say collected Western wisdom with a something of a patina of Kabbalah on it. So they scan the holy book of Kabbalah called the Zohar. And I, I actually read Aramaic and I read the Zohar in Aramaic. So when someone says they scan the Zohar, I've never heard of such a thing. They say, well, the letters themselves have power. You know, I was very skeptical about it, but I thought to myself, what do I know? Maybe someone scans the Zohar and, you know, like it energizes their chakras. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. 
I don't know where my chakras are. I don't get energy from scanning a book with my hand. Um, oh, you mean just waving the hand over it? Waving your hand book. over it and kind of looking at it, you know, as your hand goes across it, it'll, it'll somehow energize whatever and be transformative. So I put that under the rubric of the magical Kabbalah or sure. the theurgic Kabbalah. I'm much more in the transformational, which is hard work, hard inner work, a lot of honesty, a lot of, you know, stoic virtue, managing of consciousness, no pain, no gain. That's more my, the way that I teach uh, Kabbalistic spiritual psychology. So what does the pain look like? Um, I'll give you an example. So a uh, person comes to me and says, uh, my grandchildren are not grateful. I, I send them checks sure. and they don't call me. And the woman tells me what a good grandmother she is. So she's claiming love. Now, love, uh, there's 10 Kabbalistic emanations of God. One of them is called chesed, which means love, beneficence, etc. So she has a chesed image of herself. I can see it. I am a nice, loving grandmother. Now, we also believe that these different emanations, that these 10 emanations in the mind of God, they're also within human being, but in human beings, they're broken and corrupted. So she says, I'm a loving grandmother. Why don't they love me? And I said, are you expecting a phone call? She said, yes, just decency and, and, and etiquette. I said, so there's some reciprocity intended in the birthday card. She said, yes. I said, that's lower order love. I said, if you want to operate at higher chesed, it's the de desire to serve and benefit. If you're trying to extract a behavior, you need to look inside and realize that really isn't love. It's something else. Mm -hmm. So she fought me. And I could see her confidence be shaken. I said, you need to look inside. Now, this was very hard work for her. She came to me. I said, why'd you come to me? She said, to tell me that I'm right. I said, well, you're not right. <laughs> I said, it would be better to call your kids and say, I really miss you. I'm heartbroken that you don't call me, but I understand you're teenagers. I will send you money no matter what. I love if you call me on occasion. That's vulnerable. It's true. You're not playing games. Yeah. This is hard for her. So when you look at any of these 10 Kabbalistic emanations, we each carry a broken version within, and to really understand that we have a false self, which is the assembly of all the inner brokenness, and the way to um, break through the false self to the true self is to look at our inner breakage and try to bring repair. This is not for sissies, excuse me, but this is, this is hard work. You got to stay conscious. You got to be courageous. You got to be able to look inside. So I'm beginning to see uh, how this might connect through to the other work that you do, which is working with recovering addicts Absolutely. as well. Yeah. In fact, uh, Kabbalah is always in the background of probably everything that I do. It's it's actually my faith system. I call myself a Kabbalist. I don't mean to be pretentious, but when people really ask me, what do I mean by God? What do I mean by language, consciousness? I really live ultimately in the world of the Kabbalah. I don't talk about it much unless I'm pushed, but you're pushing me. So you're okay. Right. So do you find that a useful yes. tool to talk to people who are uh, coming out of alcoholism or opiate uh, addiction uh, or whatever? Absolutely, because um, they know that it begins with lying to, this, to oneself. And there's always, um, you know, addicts are known, known to themselves as people who exploit and manipulate and so forth. So I'm teaching a lot of consciousness of how the inner self works. So if you can stay conscious of what I call the ego self, so the assemblage of inner brokenness, to put it on a Kabbalistic term, they have access to what inside is hurting so badly that the answer is to medicate. Right. Because any 12-step person, more or less, can't live with the pain, and they need to medicate. So if you can understand where the, where, where the pain is, and then you can actually go in and rewire your inner life, and you lose the need to medicate. So that's my approach. If you can, and this is not therapy. This is not psychotherapy. This is actually higher self, regulating the ego self, understand how the ego self is wired, rewiring it uh, to lessen the pain and therefore lessen the need to medicate or compensate. Does it work well with the whole 12-step approach? You know, uh, I when I was asked to do it, to run this group. And sorry, that group, was uh, that, is that just is it's that a, it's a, it's a uh, No, no, it's a, uh, um, I have a fine uh, rabbinic intern person that I became friendly with, um, when he was a student of mine at the rabbinical school where I used to teach, um, I'm still on the faculty. I've just taken a break. Sure. His name is Shia Blakeney. He and his wife and a partner founded a place in LA called Reto Recover Integrity. He sees me as his spiritual mentor. He said, I'd love to have the guys at the house uh, benefit from your wisdom. Would you come in and lead a weekly group? So I agreed to do it partly because for me, that's really the test of the efficacy of what I teach. 
Right. If this can help these guys, then it's real. If this arm bar can work against a 220-pound 18-year-old, then it works. Then it works. That's exactly, it's a perfect analogy. If this stuff will work with these guys, then it really works. Yeah, so I, I, uh, I have a weekly group. It changes a bit. Some guys are pretty regular, uh, you know, depending on how long they're at the house. And um, they love it. They tell me they love it. It's beneficial. They talk about it to their family. They talk about it to other people. And so I have the, uh, the test that they tell me it makes their lives better. Mm-hmm. How long have you been doing that? Uh, God, I think over a year now. Okay. Yeah, over yeah. a year. I don't know how you could scale something. Like if it's useful, so you got to start asking, well, how can you help more than just 10 people? And there you how go. Do you scale that? Yeah. So the question is, um, people say, Finley, when are you going to get your book done? And I'm right. always writing this book. Yes. And every year I get smarter, so I rewrite the book. Of right? course. Uh, so I've committed. Yes, you got to just draw a line in the sand. I got to draw point. a line in the sand, and so I'm going through what I think is going to be my final rewrite, okay. and just get the thing done and hand it off to an editor and okay. move out. Yeah. What's it called? Uh, it's going to be called Good People, Bad Habits. Okay. That sums up the people that I see. They're actually good people. Mm-hmm. They want to be good. Well, nobody, you know, starts out at age ten going, you know, what I'd really like to do. I'd really like to, you know, have to steal things out of people's backyard yeah, in order to exactly. shove a needle in my arm. And, yeah, and no shoot. one says that. Or even the, 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 the parents and the couples whom I counsel, hmm. the bad habit is something like this. I'm smart. I'm successful. People come to me for counsel. Therefore, if there's a problem in our marriage, it's probably you. Right. right so right, I will right. try to convince you of your errors. And if you don't uh, acknowledge, then, then you're being rigid and defensive. Right. Okay. Now let's start. That's, that's the game. All right. And so I, I think this is going to go downhill. Yeah. Yeah. They don't, yeah. They, they don't understand what the problem is. They say, Rabbi, I'm smart and I'm successful and other people listen to me. And my, my, I only fight with my husband. Why is that? I said, because he's your husband. That's, that's kind of, that's part of what marriage is, is that's where, you know, the walls come down and you're, you can get pretty raw. So what I realized is they're good people with terrible habits. And, um, you mentioned stoicism. There is a very strong stoic dimension, meaning that uh, there are actually rules according to which the mind works that makes things better. For example? Um, I'll give you an example. So here are rules that I give people. And I oftentimes say metaphorically, write this one on your, on your left forearm and this one on your right forearm. Take these everywhere you go. Never try to persuade a resistant person to do, believe, understand, or be aware of anything. Because when you try to make someone else do, believe, etc., and they're resistant, it's just going to escalate. You tell them as simply as you can what you want and decide what you're going to do next. And if it's nothing, then nothing. Don't tell them what to do. Tell them what you're going to do. So, for example, my daughter... So that was on one forearm? Or that's that one on, forearm. Okay. That's one one forearm. All right, sorry. I'm okay, that's on one forearm. Interrupting your flow here. No, no problem. Uh, yeah, that's one forearm. And oftentimes they'll come out and say, I tried to convince my husband that. I tried to tell my wife that. I said, okay, look at your left forearm mm-hmm. and read it to me. They go, yeah, what did you tell me to write there? I repeat it to them. So that's an example I would call of, of you know, stoic rationality, meaning let my mind accord with the true, the true rules of consciousness. Don't waste time trying to enlighten another person. Just tell them what you're going to do. And if, if it's enough of an incentive, they'll do what they're going to do. You don't have to do all this negotiating with people. Uh, the other one is, it doesn't matter what they do, semicolon. It only matters what kind of person you want to be. So they say, you would not believe what my mother-in-law said to me. I said, it doesn't matter what your mother-in-law said. What kind of person do you want to be? Mm-hmm. You wouldn't believe what my kid said to me. I said, is that going to be an excuse for what you can tell me next? Yeah. So it's essentially reclaiming power and putting it back in, in yeah, your court. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, you, you everything's have, your fault. Well, everything is your responsibility. Mm. So if another person's acting, you know, uh, aggressively and hurtfully, okay, I'm not excusing it. I'm just going to tell them what I'm going to do next. I'm not going to say, how dare you? Yeah, well, I do dare. Well, you shouldn't. Well, I, where's that going to go? It's just going to escalate. Right. So if someone says something aggressive to me, I'll say, hey, that really hurt, man. Could you rephrase that? Or I'll mm. say... You know, I'm actually ending this conversation. Or I will choke you out. You know, it's like, <laughs> I just tell them what I'm going to do. Yeah. I don't need to convince them to do to do anything. I might say, I'll offer you a rewind. 
if you'd like it. I'm not going to make you take a rewind. So when you're clear, what exactly do I want or not want? Articulate it clearly. Be ready to take no for an answer. And just decide what I'm going to do next. Mm -hmm. That's it. Now, this is very, this is for me, rules of consciousness. That when people do it, it really works. I mean, people's, you know, the temperature goes down and the escalating stops. And people, what happens is you spend so much less time in conflict that what I would call the inevitable beauty and mystery of life just starts to, just starts to flow. All of a sudden, you know, one woman said to me very beautifully, after I really got her to quit engaging with, you know, her husband's orneriness, she's always asking, why is he doing that? How come he doesn't do that? That's such a stupid way to do it. I said, drop it. No criticizing, no complaining, no condemning, minimal conflict. She said, I watched him one day and I could feel my ego mind criticizing everything he was doing. And I shut myself up and I watched him. I thought to myself, oh my God, what an interesting man. What a quirky guy. And I love him. And we're living together. Who am I to solve his problem for him? So she got it. I said, wow, the mystery of lifelong relationship with another human being. That's an incredible thing. But people can't feel it because they're so busy trying to solve another person. So the, the spiritual thing behind all of this is quiet the monkey mind, the busy mind, so you can feel the mystery and the beauty. And sometimes if you're religiously oriented, you can experience the divine. So that's the, the fuller picture of, the, of you know, my core teaching. Okay. The, the disconnecting from the, the stimulus, mm -hmm. if you will, I mean, I... I what you're saying is new to me here, but I can think of some examples. I've been kept out of a fair number of street fights in my life by just keeping this in mind that roughly one in 10 people is mentally ill. Very good. And so some guy's coming up to you in the street and you know, poking you in the chest and telling you that you should perform sexual services to him right there. Right. You're like, as opposed to punching him in the teeth, which yeah. your 18 year old version wants to do because mm -hmm. you're, you're going, well, no, this guy probably needs his lithium. Exactly. If, if I curb, you know, if I kick him in the in the balls and then beat him into a pulp, and then you know, what have I done? I've, I've stomped somebody who's mentally ill. So it's a it's very a, good, it's an excellent analogy. So I would say I don't think that really applies to a marriage situation. Necessarily. Well, it awfully can't because people actually go crazy. People mm. go crazy with anger. They go crazy with anger. I suppose so. And then I call it locking horns with a with a raging uh, uh, moose. Mm. You don't lock horns with a raging moose. Just I appreciate it. the Canadian analogy. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I worked a lot on that before I brought it up. To okay. Me. What no. can I say for yeah. Keston that would free <laughs> Canadian? Yeah. So, so you don't lock horns with a raging moose. So that's what I tell you. So someone's acting crazy. You don't have to match it. Mm -hmm. You can just say, look, honey, my wife and I have a rule. Since my wife and I are too smart, opinionated, strong willed, willed people. We had a joke early part of our marriage is that our marriage felt like a Woody Allen movie. Talk, 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 talk. And she came up with a phrase one day. She said, only one crazy person in the room at a time. Okay. So either of us, what we call ring the bell. When someone rings the bell, we both have to go to our corner. <laughs> and anybody can ring the bell anytime they wanted. So I'd, I'd say, and furthermore, she says, I'm ringing the bell. And I committed. Shut up. Go away. Yeah. We go away. Come back. Not talk about the thing until the next day. Mm. So I learned in our marriage and you're still married and we're still married okay well, i that's... think our that that got our marriage better and everything that i teach you know either i've learned from other people or I learned from my own marriage sure. so everything is uh underwriter laboratory tested okay right? everything is in the real in the real world that is the exact opposite approach of what a friend of mine just told me which is that when he's arguing with his i think it was girlfriend that what the woman wants is his argument that they don't really care about what's coming out of your mouth. You should just match them in emotional intensity. Wherever they go, if, they, if they're calm, oh my God. you should be calm. If they're intense, you should be intense. If they're angry, you should. This is his theory. That's the worst advice I, anybody could possibly give. <laughs> <laughs> so martial arts, uh, Kabbalah, and Kabbalah, yeah. and now marriage advice. Well, they're all connected. It, it was funny. I mean, yeah. who knows? Maybe uh, this was a I'll, shtick. I'll, I'll tell you why. So, you know... You, uh, one thing I learned as I, as I moved from blue to purple is you got to have a game. Right. What's my game? Yes. So part of my game is a half guard game. Okay. So when I pass the guard, I go to half guard. 
Then I pass the half guard. Right. Then I get a psychic out of the game. It doesn't matter what his game is. I mean, whatever yeah. he's doing, I'm just going to say, okay, get that grip off, do this, do this, because I'm going to get the half guard, then I'm going to pass your guard. Right. So I'm not going to do what you do. Right. Like, if you suddenly want to do some other game, I'm like, oh, I'll play your game. I'm going to play my game. Right. So It's what you know. It's what I know. Yeah. And I got to figure out how to make sure that I play my game. Now, so if another person is angry, I will say, well, my game is hold the line, hold my ground, not get angry. Say, hey, that hurt. That didn't feel good. Well, I'm ending this conversation because it doesn't matter what they do. It matters what kind of person I want to be, <laughs> right? So if they're... Your have, right forearm tattoo again. There you go. So if like, the other person has high emotional intensity, that's your game. Right. My game is to be chill and de-escalate this thing. So I think you got to decide what kind of person you want to be. And this is very much in the idea of the Kabbalistic repair the brokenness. I got a vision of what kind of guy I want to be. Mm -hmm. That's my game. It doesn't matter what they do because I got a game plan for who I want to be. I'm not going to try to change them. I'm just going to tell them what I'm going to do next. And that approach, so we can exploit that into 50 volumes. Sure. But that approach, I think, is a really, I mean, it fits on jujitsu. It's Kabbalistic. It's good for relationships. There's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of a wholeness here. So now here I am. Sitting with somebody who's talking about how to create an emotional and a, a spiritual wholeness, yet at the same time, for the last few months, you and I have been trading back and forth horror stories about the worst <laughs> experiences in human, well, some of the worst experiences in human experience, yeah. which is, we ended up down this rabbi hole yeah, right. of the Eastern Front yes. in World War II. Yes, I remember how, exactly how we did it, too. Why don't, you, why don't you tell the good well, people of how... I, I was trying to find out if I were the first rabbi at Black Belt. Yes. So you're the only real international celebrity Black Belt that I... That I have the email address have email, right? So I asked you and you said, no, I really don't. Um, and you said something that had a little bit of Jewish Yiddish knowledge. So I said, well... Uh, and you, are, you floated the, uh, the, the the balloon. Yeah, the landsman. Are you a landsman? Which means a, a country. Uh, oh, oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Some Yiddish yeah. word. Yeah. Uh, what was it? Uh, Shmuel. Oh, Shmuel. Oh, because you're Stefan. Yeah. So is your Hebrew name Shmuel? Yeah. And you said, no, I'm not Jewish. I'm German. And uh, in, in the spirit of full disclosure full, here. Full disclosure. <laughs> I said, oh, well, my, my grandmother's German, my grandfather's uh, wife. So we got on the German thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I studied Germany. And I was, in, I was in Germany for a month. And you, wow, what's your German thing? And so we went on the German thing a little bit. And then I said, I think you said, well, I have an interest in World War II. I said, I have an interest in World War II. So one thing leads to the other. And definitely we find that we're both just fixated on the experience on the Eastern Front. So yeah. here we are. Yeah, I probably what. Uh, at least 20 books in at this yeah. point. Yeah. And you turned me on to The Forgotten Soldier. Oh, my God. By Gus Sayer. Or by Guy Sager. 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 S-A-J-E-R. Yeah. Which is probably, I mean, there, there's some dispute about the exact historical veracity of, yeah. did they march from this village to that village on this day? Yeah. But it it, it doesn't really matter. It's the, an awesome book. Yeah. It's the Forgotten a, Soldier is probably the best first-hand account of World War II that it, I've ever read. It is absolutely, unquestionably. Yeah, I, I've i probably read it five times since I first uh, yeah. I first owned it. It is, um, I mean, it is, I can say, you, I mean, the horror that he communicates, mm -hmm. I can't, I really can't understand human beings living through what they live through. Um, and but the, human beings... Do, are there human beings who can live what the human body can live through? Maybe not the human mind, but what the human body can live through is amazing. It is. It, 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 yeah. We, we just keep, the thing doesn't want to die. The thing doesn't want to die. Yeah. So uh, the strange thing there, of course, is I find myself rooting for the Germans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're reading all these German accounts. Yeah. And you can't, you know, you, you, you... But ultimately, most of them were just poor schmucks. That's exactly right. That's like, why I object... Hey, we need to fight the Bolsheviks. Yeah. They're bad. Yeah. Okay, they are bad. Let's go... Exactly. So that's why when I read about the Nazi this, they weren't Nazis. They were well, drafted... Some of them were. Some were. But most were just Wehrmacht kids that were just raised in Hitler Youth. Yes. Joined the army. They're, they're just kids. 
Um, Their 18 and 19 year old kids told that the horrible enemy is waiting for them over there and that we have to, I mean, was there cynicism on the part of the people who sent them there? Absolutely. Well, either cynicism or insanity or fanaticism. Yeah. Some ism. Yeah. Nazism. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That would probably contain all of those. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, you know, a book that I recommend to you was the uh, Black Edelweiss was uh, of a a, a, uh, SS trooper who was sent to Norway. Yes. And therefore there were no atrocities. Right. There wasn't like the SS in France that on a regular basis committed mass murder. So they're, they're shock troops. Yes. Um, fighting the Russians at the northern tip of Norway. Yes. They get moved down to France and the, uh, he ends the war, uh, near Wittberg where most of his, uh, battalion mates are buried. And he discovered he, that's when he first heard of the SS atrocities. And he couldn't believe it. And he finally realized it's true. We're, we're horrible. I always have a grain of uh, doubt when I read German accounts. Because there does seem to be a lot of, these books were written 10, 20 years later, typically. And there does seem to be a, what could potentially be historical whitewashing. I knew nothing about it. We took lots of Russian prisoners and sent them to the back. And what those horrible, nasty SS guys did behind us, we don't know. Yeah. What, whether it, that's true or not. It, it, it could be. I mean, um, I know if I was writing a book about some horrible things I'd done and some other things I'd true. done, I'd probably go light on the horrible things I'd done. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, but but that, that Norwegian, no, that, it was a Waffen SS. Yeah, Waffen SS was not the SS, it was the Waffen SS, so the armed SS, his, you know, Hitler's private army. I'll tell you something interesting. When he was in France and the Americans put up a white flag to recover some wounded and they held their fire, he said, what are you guys doing? This is when you shoot. Yeah. So, so there was a kind of an SS left in him. Yes. He said, you don't let people gather their wounded. He said, no, that's how we do it here. Mm-hmm. It's like, I'm, I'm reading that book and they've just got on the boat from Norway. Ah. So they haven't made it to France yet. When you, so. when you read of his experience in France, it's, it's a trip when he suddenly hits the Western Front. Mm-hmm. It's not the Eastern Front, and it's a whole different war. Yeah. I've often wondered, and I'm sure somebody has studied, I mean, the the Germans had a lot going for them in the sense that they trained an entire generation of young boys through the Hitler Youth. They'd essentially had put everybody into a combination of army cadets and brainwashing mm-hmm. from age, I don't know when you went into the Hitler Youth, age 12 anyway, mm-hmm. through to military eligibility. Mm-hmm. The amount of amphetamines distributed mm-hmm. in World War II is insane. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, I think it was you recommended the Tiger Tracks book to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're right. continuously popping uh, these combination of morphine and amphetamines. Exactly. And you know, so better living through chemistry, <laughs> <laughs> or better fighting through chemistry. Yeah, yeah. And the um, I mean, people talk about the dis, you know, the, the German discipline. Mm-hmm. Well, I, th- I think in the Forgotten Soldier book, at one point they've come from some horrendous door-to-door street fight for a week. They've been haven't slept at all, and then they retreat and they march for another week. Then they come in through the gates of the finally they've meet, reached the German encampment. And the first thing that they do, they don't get food, they don't get sleep, they don't get a shower, they get marched in and they get have to account for where are your binoculars? Right. Exactly. <laughs> your buttons aren't buttoned up, you know. Your buttons are out of line. Yeah, you know, yeah. you've, you know, you've yeah. lost your gas mask. You've yeah. stolen property and you know, right. you're getting sent to a penal battalion where you're going to clean a minefield with your face. Yeah. So why are both you and I drawn to the Eastern Front? I think maybe it's because it's just the level of carnage there. That's part of it. You know, my first fascination, um, when I was a kid was the Western, uh, the European theater. Cause that's what we heard about. Yeah. You know, exactly. Battle of the Bulge and mm-hmm. Normandy and all that. Precisely. So as I, uh, was an older teenager. I had uh, a brother-in-law who was in the Marines in Vietnam. So I actually joined the Marines out of high school. Okay. served for three years. And that's when I became deeply interested in the campaign. campaign. So I had a fascination for years with the uh, with Guadalcanal. Mm-hmm. So I read about it deeply and intensively. And there's um, on August 21, 22, 1942, was when the Marines of the 1st Marine Division faced the... Uh, Ichiki regiment, who were had been trained to invade uh, Midway, and of course they lost the Battle of Midway, so they were mm-hmm. cooling their heels. They sent them down to Guadalcanal to just get the Marines off of Guadalcanal because they had won every battle up until that point. 
And uh, there's a book called Helmet for My Pillow by Robert Leckie. He joins the Marines in December of 41, goes through basic training, ships to Australia, ships to Guadalcanal. He's on the front line. And the Japanese are running down the beach, screaming with, with uh, their sabers and so forth. And he says, we didn't retreat. No one ever said we could retreat. It just didn't occur to anybody to get up. He says, so they massacred 2,000 Japanese soldiers running down the beach. And what Leckie describes it is it never occurred to anybody to break the line. And it just fascinated me. So the Battle of Guadalcanal was basically the Marines were stubborn. They just refused to break. Now, they're well-trained. They're good shots, had good equipment. And then when you read the Japanese side of how they lost the Battle of Guadalcanal, it's horrendous. The, the bad planning, the uncoordinated attacks, the lack of supplies, belief that they could live on spiritual energy. The Japanese made so many mistakes, and the Marines held the line. So I knew when people said to me, because it became a family joke. Uh, if somebody wanted something from me, my wife would say, ask your dad about Guadalcanal. You can have anything you want. <laughs> so we sit at the dinner table and said, Daddy, tell us about Guadalcanal. <laughs> and they say, kind of a bicycle. Right. So yeah. I was just a, you know, I was a, you know, what do you call it? Just uh, anything about Guadalcanal, I would, yeah. uh, you know, it would, it would delight me. I gave sermons on Guadalcanal. I lived well. Actually, I actually met a vet from Guadalcanal. So, Stefan, that's actually my draw, is human beings in extreme situations. Right. Why do some hold the line? Right. Which goes right back to the spiritual psychology that I teach and the stoicism. So I think of the German, the German military. I'm amazed at how they could build that military as well trained and finely honed as they did in the amount of time they did. And so when they invaded the Soviet Union. Basically from the early thirties through to 42, 43. Yeah, with the mass mobilization, because you know, it's not only running a squad, it's running a division. Right. How do you train a division commander, a regimental commander, right? A corps commander. After your army's been gutted by the Versailles Treaty. Exactly. No, none of these guys had that much experience when they invaded Poland and France, no one had ever been a division commander, corps commander in combat. So all the way down to the squad commander. So for me as someone who's fascinated with, you know, the military experience, the military mindset, putting away the, the putting aside the moral dimension. Sure. Um, it's an astonishing story of military planning and fortitude. You know, I've read many books about our operation Barbarossa, you know, how they would ford rivers and the, and the engineers and, you know, the, the amazing coordination as they just plowed through and how completely unprepared the, uh, the Soviet army was. So I've read it with an eye toward the nature of human organization, the nature of human will, the nature of human competence, um, and even in a retreat. And you look at the Russian experience, and it's filled with disorganization and miscalculation and waste of... of, of Bodies. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So... Oh, there's yeah. a minefield. Well, yeah. we'll send yeah. a thousand. Send a thousand guys people. through the minefield. And yeah. Then you we'll never, send the tanks. You never see the Marines do that. Yeah. And if the Germans did it, it was a penal battalion. Right. They really were, were skillful. So I've separated between Nazism and the, uh, and the Wehrmacht, right. personally. So I'm, I'm glad that we're trying to claw this back to modern life. And I think that is, as well, the fascinating aspect for me because it, it, it shows the person in extremis. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the, the same thing interests me about World War I, mm -hmm. living in a, in a trench yeah. for under continuous bombardment for weeks and months yeah. and crawling through no man's land because people actually, kids did this. Yeah. And yes, many of them were shattered. Well, many of them were killed. Mm -hmm. Many of them were shattered and never recovered. But many of them did recover. Yeah. I mean, who knows? Maybe they were alcoholics for most of their right. lives. But but they recovered enough to have a semblance of functionality. Mm -hmm. It just speaks to the resilience of the, of the human mind. And yeah. Look, do you read a book by Sledge, the, the Marine who was in... The super decorated guy. Um, he ended up in Okinawa. Actually, I don't, this was a different guy. He had almost no decorations. He was just a private the whole way through, just, just a grunt. Um, yeah, Sledge. His name, that was his nickname. Okay. He was at... Well, the longest action was in Okinawa. Okay. which was another carnage. And he came in a private, went out of private, never got decorated, but the, the filth and the brutality that he went through. And he came out and became a professor. I think he taught mathematics or something, you know, lived into his 80s. You know, apparently a very fine, decent, Midwestern, you know, Protestant guy. And you read the book and it's just what you're saying. How could he possibly come from that, 
go home, get married, teach college, raise a family, go to church. And that was then and this is now. Mm -hmm. And what he said is, I had nightmares my entire life. Mm -hmm. But he still raised a family. He still showed up as a citizen. The human imperative to reproduce and yeah. fend for your children. Yeah, and to live, sort of. to live a decent life. Yeah. He just, you know. Although there are many people who, you know, it's amazing when you start looking down the list of Medal of Honor recipients, people who get, say, the Congressional Medal of Honor, and then either in trouble with the military for the rest of their military career, mm -hmm. or they come back to society, and they're mm -hmm. just completely unable to function. Mm -hmm. And it may not be because of what they experienced. It may be the selection process mm -hmm. that essentially you're selecting for a sociopath or a psychopath, somebody who's great in combat. Hey, mm -hmm. go take that machine gun nest mm -hmm. by yourself with three grenades mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And somebody who's not exactly right in the head does a great job of doing that. And we reward that. That's not a guy that is going to do real well that's in a, a car wash. That's exactly right. In fact, many of these uh, Medal of Honor winners were not ordered. They just, on their own initiative, said, I can do that. Mm -hmm. You know, Audie Murphy, you know, I can, I can take the tank. Now, he actually turned out well. You Have know, you worked my, with many PTSD sufferers? Not really. My son was in Iraq twice. Okay. And he was in some heavy stuff. And we've talked. He's gone through a little bit of it. Because most of it is, I kill people I shouldn't have killed. Or I couldn't save some guys that I wanted to save. Right. Right. And then, and a lot of it is just the shells and so forth. So aside from talking at length to my son, right. I really haven't uh, had the had the opportunity right. to, uh, to to work with the veterans. But I think you're 100% right. In fact, one thing when my son was shipping out, I said to him, don't you dare bring home a medal. If you bring home a medal, I will, I will hurt you. <laughs> I said, somebody else gets the medals. You're just, you're just a Marine. You just hold the line, do your job, right? You don't need to do anything extraordinary. The Marines can get it done. And I made him promise me, no medals. So kept his promise. Okay. He, he was just he was just a solid, good Marine, did his job. When and did his job. When did his job. Came back. Yeah, came back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think you're right. I think uh some of these top people end up actually getting, you know, getting wounded. And, you know, I, I have a, a good friend who's uh, actually founded a veterans organization, and he was a young captain in the Battle of Fallujah. Okay. And he says, you know, you're going through a, a building, and it's infested with enemy snipers, and you hear noise, and you yell out in Arabic, come out, come out. They don't come out. You throw a grenade. You walk in. There's a woman and two kids there. He says, how does an 18-year-old kid ever survive that? Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we... You know, in war, we send young men to do horrific things. Mm. So it's a sad, uh, sad thing to contemplate. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I find myself more interested in the cleaner aspect, which is actually the conduct of war than the, you know, the aftermath of what happens to people. Right. And well, then, of historical, course, historical, at least to this historical, point. Historical. Yeah. yeah. The, the historical point. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, wondering about myself, you know, when I was in, when I was in the Marines, you know, would I, would I measure up? Mm -hmm. I think when I was in boot camp and so forth, that was our biggest question of all the young Marines was, would I measure up to our uh, our legacy? Right. And that, that legacy actually was a great motivator uh, for us. I suppose so. I suppose, And it, it's also a normalization. Like, yes, it's okay to go and right. put a bayonet through somebody yeah. or, or whatever because other Marines have done it. And, right. And, and, and they're, they're trying to kill us. Right. Yeah. It's either, I mean, either they kill me and my buddies or we kill them. Right. It's, as, it's as existential as that. Um, and if we break and run, we get shot in the back. Uh, yeah. Certainly there were many, and to take it back to the German example, there were many German soldiers who'd long since lost faith in national socialism right. and the German mission to take over the East mm -hmm. who were fighting just purely because of that. Yeah. It, if we don't do this, they are going to come and we are all going to die. Exactly. They just wanted to, to survive the war. Did you see the German uh, language miniseries on the Second World War? Heimat? Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. I, Very good, I, huh? Well, it, it, it spanned many decades, but the... Oh, no, so not Heimat. Um, oh, Downfall. No, that was on Hitler's last uh, days. Okay, this that's is it a, for my German miniseries. I've, I've okay. watched Downfall, so, which is where that, you know, like Hitler reacts to the Worm Guard yeah, videos and yeah, stuff like that, yeah. which Pete, you might have seen. It's a very, very funny. If you Google Hitler reacts to the Worm Guard, you'll see yeah. one of my favorite jiu-jitsu spoofs. Yeah. But that Hitler losing his mind yeah. is from that, from uh, that yeah, series, I, Downfall. Uh, yes, I, I, that I watched, and I uh, this is one. It's about five episodes, and it tracks uh, five friends in Berlin. I read, I read the uh, the synopsis of this, and yeah. it's on the list. It's very yeah. good. 
It's very good. Yeah. So one's Jewish, two guys go in the army, one's a woman uh, actress, um, and it follows these five people from 1940, 41 through the end of the war. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's very well done. But one of the characters is your guy um, that you mentioned. Is he, he's just fighting, so he and his his compatriots can survive the war. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's it's the study of human fortitude. You right. know, of people under pressure. How do people respond under pressure? So regardless of whether that's the extreme pressure of living in a trench or living in a hitherto unhappy marriage for 30 years. They're, they're, I, I, we, we say in Hebrew, lahavdil, not to make them analogous cases. But there is a sense where, where you know, people are, are in the trench. They live like a rat, not like a human. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'll see a couple where they've gotten so much invective and so much bitterness. And when they learn, there's, just, there's another way. Mm -hmm. You can give up the resentment. Not focus on the past. There's a way to lift your consciousness. I mean, really, it's really liberating for people. So there's a way to, um, I think it was Santanyana who said, you can be a resident of this world, but a citizen of another. Oh, that's really, Isn't I've, it I've nice? not heard that before, but. It's beautiful. I'm a resident. Are, are you allowed to invoke him as, as, a, as a rabbi? I think I can invoke anybody I want. Okay. Because the rabbi thought police are very underfunded, right? <laughs> so they're like years before they get to me, if they hear this podcast. Okay. Yeah. So, uh. Um, you get a good head start on them. Yeah. 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 They'll, they'll, they, they, they can't find me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I love that concept. I'm a resident of this world, but I'm a citizen of another. And this other world is that world of higher consciousness. And that's where I'm accountable. Mm -hmm. So I'm accountable there and I, I'm living it out here. Have you heard of the Dog Brothers? Uh, they're a full contact stick fighting group based out of Los Angeles, essentially. But Vaguely. So basically, it's very heavy contact with very large sticks and minimal gear. Huh. And their credo or their motto, I'm not sure which it is, is higher consciousness through harder contact. Which uh, <laughs> I heard of that. Yeah, that sounds a bit familiar. Yeah. So but, uh, I, yeah. I guess it's just shift, just like jujitsu can shift your frame of what's difficult. Mm. You know, somebody goes in and they, I'm sure you've seen it. You've seen somebody come in and they lose their mind in the close physical proximity mm. or a little bit of discomfort because somebody's kneeling on their arm and their mm. arm hurts. Mm. And then a few months or a few years later, they're in there and they're fighting off neon face or mm. something and or full neon belly and something that they thought was impossible before yeah. is now eminently possible. There you go. That That's an analogy I oftentimes give. That uh, sometimes I'll be going with a lower belt who has neon face or yeah. some kind of really intense uh, grinding. And I look at them and I'm thinking to myself, you think I'm going to tap because your elbow's in my jaw? Mm -hmm. I said, when I was a white belt, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. So one thing that, you know, when I think good means to get, get a blue belt is you can suffer. Yes. You're not going to tap out from pain. You'll tap it. I can't breathe or you're going to break it. Other than that, you don't tap. And um, that's what I say to people. You know, they say, well, I couldn't stand it anymore. I said, let me tell you about standing it anymore. Okay. I just tell them about jujitsu. Mm -hmm. you know? And if with progressive desensitization and mm -hmm. pushing yourself to the limit, mm -hmm. I, I suppose it's no different than becoming a better runner. You, you run mm -hmm. and it's difficult and then you run the next time. You yeah. go a little bit further and yeah. you're just learning to withstand discomfort yeah. for longer and longer. Yeah. So... I'm sure your record on the mat is far beyond mine, but we both know one thing. When you decide not to tap from pain, only if you're going to stop breathing or have something broken, but you grind my face, knee in the belly, whatever you want, I'm not going to tap. You just decide one day, mm -hmm. right? I'll tap before I black out and I'll tap before you break something. Other than that, bring it on. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when people say, well, I had to respond to that or I'm not going to be treated like a doormat. I said, well, who are you? Mm -hmm. Like, what are we talking about here? I say, you can't withstand a little bit of grinding. Mm. Just let them grind on you. So what? You don't have to respond. You don't have to freak out. Right? Sometimes I actually give people belts in my counseling practice. <laughs> I swear. Because I, I tell them about the stripe system. Yeah, I, say, yeah, yeah. I say, put a stripe on your belt. So one time a person comes in, a woman's you know, husband is incredibly angry and provocative. And she tells me how she handled it. said, you just got your blue belt. Awesome. You, know, you just got your that blue belt. That is so funny. I can't it think is. of a better note to... Oh, okay. And this uh, podcast on okay. is handing out uh, jiu-jitsu blue belts in, in a marital or was it marital counseling? Uh, yes. Or just no um, uh, counseling a one person about okay. a troubled marriage. But awesome. this woman told me her story and it was consistent and coherent. I said, "You just got your blue belt." Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, My Mr. Uh, 
you know, Mr. Rabbi, Mr. Black Belt Rabbi. <laughs> it's uh, been a fantastic. And it's uh, an honor uh, and pleasure to meet Stefan Kesting in the uh, live, in real person. Well, it's an amazing thing that the internet that we can have. What did, what did we describe that? We said, uh, I'm German, Polish, Swiss, mm -hmm. Canadian. Mm -hmm. Talking to an Irish, you've got Eastern European blood in you. I have. Uh, my mother is uh, Polish, Lithuanian, Romanian. My father's side is uh, Irish, German, Jewish, Jew. Jewish. Yeah, living in Los Angeles, Los Angeles. and we're training a Brazilian martial art <laughs> that <laughs> started in, in Japan. Started in Japan. So and here we are. Yeah, we are. It's like the the you know, we're citizens of the world. And we are. We are. It's beautiful. Love it. Okay. Thank you, Stefan. Well, it's been beautiful. Thanks so much, Morgan. Thank Thank you. Thank you.